Amelia's past continues to be shrouded by quite a bit of mystery, parts of which were very discreetly scattered throughout this episode. While some of you may have noticed these subtle details, there's quite a few that wouldn't have made sense unless you read the novels, and a lot of them help to enrich the overall mystery that we're slowly unraveling. So let's do as we usually do and use this cut content to better understand Amelia's trial. Let's begin. Episode 42, Journey of Memories, covering chapters 1 and 2 from volume 14 of the light novel. Picking things up from the end of the last episode, we saw that Echidna was not impressed by Amelia's arrival. She had absolutely no expectations for Amelia to overcome this trial, so it was for that reason that she didn't even want to watch Amelia challenge it. But as we saw, Amelia wasn't going to let her resolve be swayed by these words. Instead, she continued deeper into this forest that had taken shape directly from the confines of her memories. Now, when Echidna had to stop to catch her footing, Amelia made the suggestion for her to go barefoot. She even went so far as to take off her own shoes just to show how helpful it could be. But the reason that Echidna was even struggling in the first place wasn't because of what she was wearing. It was simply because she herself had entered the dream a bit too deeply enough that both her and Amelia were still capable of interacting with the environment. So, in order to fix this, Echidna basically modified the settings of the world, a power unique to her as the ruler of this domain, one that determined who could do what. After she went on to explain what this world was, Amelia still found herself confused by the prospect of it just being a replay of her memories. She was curious as to how far her level of interaction could actually go. So, she asked if the forest would get messed up if she was to go on a rampage. It was a question Echidna found to be foolish yet somewhat fitting to Amelia. But even if that was how she felt, she did still give an answer by saying it was impossible. As they were now, both Amelia and Echidna were a half step removed from this plane of existence, making it so that neither of them could interact with the environment or people within it. If she was able to do either of those things though, then that was something that Echidna said would make the trial completely different. This was a response that made Amelia even more curious than she was before. She was now interested in knowing what Echidna meant by that. So with another question right after the first, Echidna couldn't help but mock Amelia's ignorance. Her constant flow of questions only went to highlight her significant lack of independence. It displayed her inability to think for herself. And that was the part of her that Echidna really hated. Even after being told to think about it for herself, Amelia immediately responded saying that she already did, then asked for the answer. It was a response that went to elevate Echidna's emotions to a level that very few have ever done before. She said that only Subaru and the other witches were ever capable of inspiring such deep feelings of emotion. But unlike with them, the single emotion Echidna felt towards Amelia was one of pure displeasure. Now, Echidna didn't exactly mention Subaru and the other witches by name, but she did refer to them as her friends. As soon as Amelia heard this word, she pretty much instinctively responded in a way that exposed her envy, a response that Echidna couldn't help but scoff at. In any case, Amelia's failure to understand the purpose of this world led Echidna to give a much more extensive description of it. She went on to talk about how moments in life often lead to regrets and how those regrets can sometimes take root deep in a person's heart. While she did understand that they were painful to bear, she also understood that these regrets could serve to be the foundation supporting very precious relationships. It's for that reason that each trial needs to be handled differently. The way a person's regrets are manifested in their heart will ultimately determine the level of interaction required to overcome it. So, for a case like Amelia's, talking things over to the people of her memories simply wasn't enough. She needed something more if she was going to find the answer to the trial. That's why hers is inherently different from Subaru's. Anyway, with Amelia now having a better understanding of the trial, the two of them were able to make their way to the princess room. Because Echidna seemed to already know the purpose of this tree, it made Amelia ask how much she already knew about her. But that was a question to which Echidna didn't answer. Instead, she just decided to feign ignorance leaving Amelia wondering just how much Echidna was hiding from her. So, with no other choice but to continue on, Amelia stepped into the princess room to commence the first memory of her past. The opening scene with Fortuna had left out a detail regarding Amelia's memory of her. After talking about each other's eyes, Fortuna went on to say how she really had a lot to regret, 
She began to talk about how if she had known to be kinder to a lot of people, then she wouldn't have had to rely on her brother to the very end. It was a very vague statement given with a very lonely expression. But what was more important than the contents of her statement was the peculiar manner in which she said it. You see, Fortuna had the tendency to emphasize the word, really. It was a force of habit that Amelia herself adopted and continued to mimic. The only difference, though, was that Amelia didn't use it when she was sad. Instead, she chose to emphasize the word when she was happy and smiling. This was because she wanted to associate her mother's favorite phrase with feelings of joy. She wanted to separate it from the usual memories of sadness and loneliness. So, this was her way of painting over the bad memories with good ones. That said, I'm sure you've pieced together that this is why we tend to see Amelia stress the word really. It was a subconscious force of habit that she picked up from her mother. Now, when small Amelia was left to herself, the reason she had never chosen to go outside before was because she knew that her mother would always come back so long as she waited. Not the biological one that was too busy to take care of her, though. No, she was waiting for her second mother figure that she loved just as much. You see, Amelia actually really enjoyed the prospect of having two mothers. To imagine being cared for by another person as loving as Fortuna was something that she really liked to think about. So having two mothers wasn't exactly a bad thing for her. In any case, this was the time that Amelia decided not to wait. Which brings us now to the scene with Juice and Fortuna. While it was pretty much the same, the way they translated some of Juice's lines did change the context for what it implied. The first was when he was talking about his responsibility, rather than saying it was an obsession that bordered on delusion. What he really meant was that it was a compulsion turned into obsession. His lingering regrets made him compelled to follow through with his duty to the point that it became his obsession. Then, the second was when he talked about the hundred years of turmoil. This wasn't just a figure of speech in which he was saying Fortuna's words were enough to carry him through it. It was more like he was saying that they already did carry him through it. He was talking as if to imply that he'd already been through that century of anguish. So, that's a bit more context towards Juice's relation to the settlement. Aside from that, there was also the mention of a specific role being tossed around, one that was unique to both Archie and Fortuna. When Archie had made his entrance into the conversation, he had introduced himself as the next Guardian, a position we find out he's going to eventually adopt from Fortuna. We don't exactly know what this role entails, but we do know that Fortuna did mention how Archie needed to become more dependable for it. Only after he did would she be able to entrust her precious treasure to him. Whether she was talking about Amelia or the forest itself, well, that's something that I'm sure we'll find out later. What's clear though is that the Guardian is a very important role within this community. Now, after the first memory was finished, there was a bit more to Amelia's conversation about it with Echidna, specifically relating to the so-called fairy. What had happened was Echidna first commented on small Amelia's poor character. She wasn't the biggest fan of how this child was acting. Despite having such a loving mother to care for her, she still broke her promise, left the room, eavesdropped, and even lied. It was a string of actions that Echidna found to be very distasteful, and Amelia couldn't even disagree with it. What she did do, though, was actually give thanks to Echidna for complimenting her mother like that. Fortuna truly was a caring person, so Amelia was happy that somebody else was able to acknowledge that as well. As she reminisced on all the fond memories of the person she loved the most, she also remembered the two most significant names that came after hers, Juice and Fairy. Echidna found it very ironic that Amelia chose to name this lesser spirit Fairy. Reason being that Fairy was typically a term used to refer to an evil spirit. Of course, small Amelia didn't know that yet. I mean, one of the storybooks in her room even said that fairies were good. But the truth of the matter was that no spirit would ever be happy when being referred to as a fairy. So even if Amelia was given the impression that fairies were supposed to be these gentle and reliable creatures, it didn't change the fact that spirits hated being called that name. It's an interesting detail in the way things turned out that Echidna found to be most unexpected. In any case, the bond between Amelia and this lesser spirit she fondly referred to as fairy continued to grow. Every time she'd escape from the tree, She'd use fairies' help to do all sorts of mischievous things. Whether it be taking people's snacks or sneaking into people's houses, Amelia was always just running around doing whatever she wanted. The thing she liked to do the most, though, was listen in on Juice and Fortuna's conversations. She found that that was the best opportunity to find out stuff about her real parents. 
It's not like they came up in conversation very often, but when they did, Amelia was always happy to hear about it. That said, there was a topic that came up 100% of the time, and that was the checkup on the seal of the forest. The second time we see Fortuna respond to it, she actually brought up a bit more information about her role as the Guardian. Not only was she responsible for monitoring the seal, but this time she also mentioned something about a key. Whatever that key was, apparently it was part of her duties as the Guardian to watch over it, just like how she did with the seal, Amelia, and the forest. Now, when Amelia heard that Fortuna carried out her duties for the sake of those two, she assumed that she was talking about her parents. This was what piqued her interest in the seal. Up until now, Amelia never really paid attention to the importance of it. But because this time her name was mentioned in the same sentence as it, it made her think that perhaps her parents could be found beyond it. Perhaps they were hidden away somewhere that the seal prevented her from going. So, if that seal was in fact somewhere in the forest, then Amelia wanted to know where she could find it. She wanted to see if it could bring her closer to her real parents. Which brings us now to Amelia's memory of the first time she found it. One thing to note about this area is that the white surrounding the door isn't snow. It's actually nothing more than a discoloration of the world itself. You see, this was a sacred area exempt from the laws of the world. So that's why every bit of nature within it took on this pure white color. After small Amelia was done examining this area, we saw her come across Juice face to face for the first time ever. And it was as he was crying his tears of joy that he also said a brief line that gave us a bit more context as to why. He said that the reason for his tears was because Amelia and her people had saved him. That was the sole reason for why he was so happy. To Amelia, this was very much a strange display of emotion, but something about it did seem to resonate with her. It reminded her of how she felt whenever she wanted to cry. So, because this was the emotion she tied to Juice's reaction, her response became the same as the one her mother always gave her. She felt that what Juice needed right now was the warming embrace of someone's arms. Perhaps that would grant him the same happiness it always brought for her. That was her reasoning behind why she went to comfort him. So, this was yet another example of Amelia mimicking the actions of her mother. Now, after that was done, Amelia went hand in hand with Juice to go see Fortuna. She decided that she could no longer hide her adventures anymore. It was finally time to tell Fortuna about what she'd been doing. So she did. This was the last scene Amelia saw before the beginning of her true trial. It was the memory of an angry Fortuna raging at the both of them. Eventually, she did come to accept the situation, though. She acknowledged that this was the way things were now and started to head back to the settlement with them. When the real Amelia came to accept this as the true memory of her past, she also understood why she wouldn't have been able to do so before. You see, Puck's pact that sealed away all her memories ensured that even if she did meet anyone from her past, she wouldn't be able to understand what it meant to her. Instead, it made it so that there would only ever be pain and sorrow. Although this was meant to protect Amelia's heart, it also guaranteed Amelia's failure of the trial. That's why now she was able to make it farther than she ever had before. So, as the memory continued with Amelia's journey back to the settlement, the whole thing was quite literally taken word for word from the novel. The only difference that needs to be mentioned comes from the description of Greed himself. What the anime didn't show was that his very appearance was the embodiment of the color white. Everything from his skin color to the clothing he was wearing was absolutely colorless. It was as if his very existence couldn't be affected by color at all. Since there was no tan to his skin or hue to his clothes, you could almost compare it to the pure white that surrounded the seal. But that was a phenomenon that Fortuna didn't care for. All she cared about was the intruder that had stumbled into her forest. Bringing us now to the end of the episode. So, that's pretty much everything we missed so far from Amelia's trial. I'm sure a lot more of the mystery will be unraveled over the next couple of episodes, but I think it was important to highlight the subtle behaviors Amelia adopted from Fortuna. Now, before I go, if you enjoyed watching this video then be sure to leave a like or comment. It really does help the video to do better. But anyway, as always thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed this type of anime content then you already know what to do. So until next time, ciao!